Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel where we talk about data visualizations in Python. Today we're talking about the Seaborn Cluster Map. The Seaborn Cluster Map is a matrix plot. You'll be able to visualize your matrix entities through heat map, but you'll also get a clustering of your rows and columns. So let's take a look in the Seaborn code. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and import the Seaborn library. And I'm also importing PyPlot as well as NumPy and Pandas for some data handling. By the way, all of the code I'm about to show you is available on my GitHub page. So to start off with the cluster map, I want to show you a simple toy example first. Here I have some data about four hypothetical students. I have their name, their hours studied, the score they got on a test, and their street address. So right now this toy data is in a dictionary, but I'm also gonna go ahead and convert this to a pandas data frame, and I'm setting the index to be the student's name. So we have four hypothetical students and three different columns of data. So note here that I've purposely designed this data set so that hours studied and score are pretty similar for each student, whereas street address really has nothing to do with the other features. You can also notice that two of these students, Andy and Claire, have pretty similar hours studied and pretty similar scores. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a cluster map for these data. To do that, I'll reference the Seaborn library and call up the cluster map. Then I just need to pass in this entire data frame, and that's called toy data. So the first thing you'll notice is that the Seaborn cluster map is quite large, so let's actually reduce the size of this figure. There's a nice argument in here called fig size, and we can just pass in a tuple of what we would like this figure size to be. So I'm gonna reduce this down to four by four. And let's also use one more keyword argument. This anode, we'll set that to true, and that will just allow us to see the actual numbers printed out on the heat map portion of the cluster map. Okay, so right off the bat, we see in the middle of this cluster map, we have a nice heat map that details the different numbers that were in our matrix. We have lower values getting darker colors and higher values getting lighter colors. But you'll also notice that we have these lines to the left and to the top of this heat map. Those lines are called dendrograms, and that's how Seaborn has clustered our data. Taking a look at the columns first, here we see that our studied and score have been clustered together. So this is basically showing me the distance from our study to score as if these were both four-dimensional vectors. So since their distance is the smallest, they will be clustered together first in the dendrogram, and then we add on street address, which is less similar to these other two columns. So you can think of this dendrogram as giving you a sense of how far away each of these different columns are from each other. And the same thing's happening in the rows. Here we see that Andy and Claire have been paired together before the other students have been added on. So that means the Andy and Claire vectors are actually closer together than the other data points. You'll also notice that Seaborn has reordered our rows and our columns. This reordering is somewhat arbitrary, but we're basically just trying to group points that are close to each other together and then so on. But there are many different ways to draw the dendrogram, so you may see those rows and columns reordered in different ways. To produce those clusters, Seaborn is using an algorithm called Hierarchical Agglomerative Clustering, or HAC. So how exactly does HAC work? So imagine that we have two axes like this and five data points. Let's go ahead and label those. So here we have five data points. HAC begins by assigning each of those points to its own cluster. So at this point, we have five clusters overall. The next step is to merge together the two closest clusters. So that's these two points, point one and point two. Now we have four clusters overall, and we're gonna continue doing this. We look for the next two closest clusters, and now we have three total clusters, and we'll just continue doing this. In the next step, we find that point three actually merges in with the blue cluster. So overall, we have two clusters. And then finally, we're going to continue this until all clusters are merged in together and we have one overall cluster. But the other cool thing is that the order of merging forms what's called a dendrogram. So imagine those same five points. Well, what happened in the first step? Points one and two merge together. In the second step, points four and five merge together. Then point three merged with the blue cluster 
And finally, all the points were merged in together. And we can also think about the distance between the points getting larger as we move upward on this dendrogram. So this dendrogram is exactly what we see in the Seaborne cluster map. And you can use it to tell which points and which clusters are closest to each other. So now let's see the cluster map on a more advanced data set. So here I'm loading in some data from the Seaborne library, and these data are about penguins. And we have about 300 different penguins in this data set. So let's build a cluster map for these data. The data that you pass through to one of these cluster maps should be numerical. So I'm actually going to filter down to just the numerical columns of this data frame. That includes the bill length, bill depth, flipper length, and body mass. Okay, now that we have those, Let's go ahead and make a cluster map. We'll call up Seaborn and ask it to build a cluster map. Then we're going to be passing through the penguins data frame, and I'm going to just filter down to my numerical columns. And there we go, we have a cluster map for these particular data. So one thing that you'll immediately see here is that we have three columns of very dark values and only one column of very light values. That's because we have different scales for these different columns. Three columns have smaller values, and one column, the body mass, actually has very large values. This can make for a kind of unhelpful heat map. So one thing I would recommend here is to actually scale your data. There are a couple ways to scale your data within the cluster map, but one easy way is to use this argument called standard scale. And then the value for this will either be zero if we want to scale each row, or one if we want to scale each column. In this case, let's scale the columns. Now you'll see that each of the columns actually ranges from zero to one. So we've basically just made sure that we've subtracted off the minimum of each column and divided by the range. So all of the values are now going to live between zero and one. This helps us put each of those columns on the same scale so that we can compare them a little bit easier. Now we build a cluster map here and let's take a look at what we've found. For starters, these two columns, which are actually the body mass and flipper length, happen to be the most similar once we've standard scaled everything. Then we have the bill length, and finally the bill depth is the furthest away. We can also see that all of the different penguins have actually been clustered as well, and this could potentially help us figure out which penguins are most similar to each other. Finally, you'll also see that there's kind of two regions happening here. We have some penguins up here where these three features are actually kind of small, and this final feature is kind of large. Then we have another region at the bottom where we have just the opposite. These three features are at the higher end, and this feature is at the lower end. What's actually happening here is that we have just different species of penguins in this data set, but we'll come back to that in just a bit. For now, just know that this cluster map can help us look for these types of trends and see if there are clusters in our data set. There are two important properties that determine the clusters that HAC will find, the metric and the linkage. So metric is just the distance metric that you'll use to judge distances between points and between clusters. The default here is Euclidean distance, which is just your everyday spatial distance but you could switch this to something else if you'd prefer. For example, Manhattan distance or cosine distance. When thinking about linkage, let's go back to this situation. We have the blue cluster with points one and two, and then the orange cluster with points four and five. And we're trying to determine where three should be merged in. Well, there's multiple ways to do this. With single linkage, what we're going to do is compare point three to the closest points in each of the clusters. So for this case, that's points two and four. We would then determine which point is closer to point three, and in this case, that's point two. So we're actually going to merge in point number three in with the blue cluster. But you can also imagine other ways of doing this as well. With complete linkage, now we actually compare point three with the furthest point in each cluster. In this case, point five is closer to three than one is, so now we would merge in point three with the orange cluster. In the Seaborn cluster map, you can change both the linkage and the metric used to judge the distances. So let's try to change the linkage first. In Seaborn, that argument is called method. The default method is to average up the members of the cluster and to use an average linkage, but you can switch this to other linkage types as well, for example, we can switch over to single, which is a minimum linkage. 
One big difference you might see when you switch over to single is that your dendrogram is starting to get a little bit different. When you use single linkage, you're able to build clusters that are more elongated and slender. And you're able to see that here in the dendrogram that we're linking up longer and longer clusters. Seaborn is leveraging SciPy or Fast Cluster in the back end. So if you want to see more about these available linkage options, you can check out the SciPy documentation. It's also possible to switch your distance metric within the Seaborn cluster map. The default here, of course, is Euclidean, but if you'd like to switch that, you can switch metric to something like city block. This means that you're using a Manhattan distance to judge the distances within those clusters. And there are a few additional options that you have when building your own cluster map. So let's take a look at those in the Seaborn code. One of the coolest additional options with the Seaborn cluster map is called row colors or call colors. So let's see how this works. In this case, I'm actually going to be assigning one color to each species of penguin in my data set. So I have Adelie penguins, Chimstrap, and Gentoo, and I'm just assigning each of those a color. And I'm pulling this data from my penguin species column, which is categorical. So I'm saving that as species color, and at this point, I actually have one color for every single bird in my data set. So let's take a look at the top of this. This is just going to be a panda series with a bunch of different colors in it. Okay, so once I have those species colors, I can actually use them as kind of a flag in my cluster map. So going down to my cluster map, I'm going to use this other argument called row colors. And this should be one color for every single row in the cluster map. So for us, that's the species colors. Now you'll see what's happened. We have flagged every single row with the species type of this penguin. So blue, remember, was Adelie. And then we had red for chin straps and green for gen twos. So even without explicitly clustering up each different type of bird, we're able to use this flag to see that that's how these birds have been clustered, by species. This will help you figure out if a particular categorical feature in your data set is important for the clustering. So here we have mostly Adelie penguins, but a couple of those chin straps have snuck in. And down here at the bottom, we only have Gen 2s clustered together. So it's pretty cool. You can try this out with any different categorical feature in your data set. So like we just saw, the Seaborn cluster map is super cool because we not only get a heat map, we also get a clustering of our data through that hierarchical agglomerative clustering algorithm. One word of caution though, if you do happen to have a really, really large matrix, this can take a little while to run. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave me a comment below and I'll see you next time.